Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Globalising the Tudors. This is the fourth event in the Paul Mellon Centre public event series, Tudors Now. Um, so uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you this evening. Um, art history is increasingly attending to the global dimensions of objects and their material histories. And I'm delighted to be joined today by three experts in this field to discuss the global interconnectedness of Tudor visual and material culture. We'll be looking west to England's colonial intentions in the New World and east to diplomatic relations with the Ottoman Empire and Tudor fantasies about contact with China. Our speakers today are Lauren Working, Matthew Dimmock, and Jerry Broughton. Lauren is a lecturer in Renaissance studies at the University of York. Her research explores how English colonialism influenced taste and politics in 17th century London, and she's written on a diverse range of subjects, including civility and intoxication, female travellers, and the colonial gaze. Her first book, The Making of an Imperial Polity, Civility and America in the Jacobean Metropolis, jointly won the Royal Historical Society Whitfield Prize in 2021. And she also works with museums, including a collaborative project on shipwrecked porcelain and contemporary poetry at the World Museum in Liverpool, and an exhibition on global networks at Middle Temple Library. She is a consultant for the National Portrait Gallery and a BBC Radio 3 New Generation thinker. Matt Dimmock is Professor of Early Modern Studies and Associate Dean for Research at the University of Sussex. His prize-winning research on early modern English engagements with the wider world includes the books New Turks, Mythologies of the Prophet Muhammad, Elizabethan Globalism, and the Cambridge Elements Writing Tudor Exploration. With Andrew Hadfield, he recently edited the expanded second edition of Amazons, Savages, and Machiavels, Travel and Colonial Writing in English, 1550 to 1630. And he's currently writing a book about the English navigator and explorer John Davis, provisionally titled The Seeker. Jerry Broughton is Professor of Renaissance Studies at Queen Mary University of London. He's a prize-winning and best-selling author of nine books published in more than 20 languages. These include Global Interests, Renaissance Art Between East and West, The Renaissance Bazaar, From the Silk Road to Michelangelo, The Sale of the Late King's Goods, Charles I and his Art Collection, which was shortlisted for the Samuel Johnson Prize, and the prize-winning New York Times bestseller, A History of the World in 12 Maps. He is also a broadcaster, having presented more than 10 BBC television and radio series, including Maps, Power, Plunder and Possession uh, for BBC Four, One Direction for BBC Radio Four, presumably not about the boy, okay, and uh, Blood and Bronze, and We Are the Tudors, both for BBC Radio Three. He has curated a number of exhibitions, including Penelope's Labour, Weaving Words and Images uh, for the Venice Biennale in uh, 2011, and Talking Maps for the Bodleian Library in Oxford in 2019 to 2020. His book, This Orient Isle, Elizabethan England and the Islamic World, was a Radio 4 Book of the Week, uh, a Waterstones Nonfiction Book of the Year, and winner of the Historical Writers Association Prize for Nonfiction. And he's currently writing another book on the four points of the compass and a global history of discovery. So I can't think of three better overachievers to discuss globalizing the Tudors with us this evening, and I'm delighted that they're able to join us. So the format will be, um, they will each speak for about 10 minutes on a single object uh, to get us going and think, thinking about some of these themes. Then we'll move to a round table discussion before opening questions to the floor. Um, so if Lauren would like to take the stand. Thank you. Um, thank you so much, Christina. Um, it's such a pleasure to be here and take part in this series, which I've really been enjoying um, kind of listening in on so far. Um, so I'll just turn to my image. So on the 18th of June 1912, workmen tore down a timber frame building in Cheapside, not far from St. Paul's Cathedral. The building sat on a 17th century site, and as these workmen demolished the floor, they struck a casket, revealing a glimmer of gems. They had stumbled upon what is now referred to as the Cheapside Hoard, um, which has been called the greatest single collection of Elizabethan and early Stuart jewelry in the world. This collection contains hundreds of dazzling pieces of Tudor workmanship, enameled chains, amethysts, an emerald watch, cameos, Indian and Persian stones, and even beads from Africa and Argentina. 
So in the 10 minutes I have, or nine minutes and 50 seconds, um, I want to talk about one of those objects, and that's this small sparkly emerald pin shaped like a parrot. So parrots were considered to be symbols of erotic love. The choice of gemstone might be significant here, as the color green could signify new love or perhaps jealous love. Um, the parrot has been drilled for setting into a jewel, so um, it was probably meant to be worn on the body, perhaps pinned to a sleeve or bodice. In addition to the connections with unsentimental or lecherous love, parrots were also beginning to appear more frequently as objects of curiosity and status in Tudor England. There is an instance of a man being brought to his local justice of peace to answer for stealing a neighbor's parrot. Um, in March 1596, Queen Elizabeth's Secretary of State wrote to Sir John Gilbert announcing that Her Majesty should like a parrot of his, only to be met by Gilbert's protest that he had never actually owned one. The parrot, Elizabeth's Secretary sternly wrote, shall be delivered. Um, there are several extant portraits with parrots in them, um, kind of starting around this time, although they become a bit more frequent in the early 17th century. Um, so there's one of an African gray parrot um, accompanying an Elizabethan woman. Um, and then there are several more that I've come across of kind of green and red parrots from Central and South America, um, including recently um, coming across a miniature from the early 17th century of a child holding a parrot by an anonymous artist. Um, and in the decades that follow, they become a bit more ubiquitous. So paintings such as Van Dyke's portrait of the Earl of Denby, um, Denby includes a, a very flashy multicolored parrot um, kind of flying across one of the corners. So following on the trail of this emerald, I began searching for other mentions of emeralds in Tudor London. Privy purse expenditures in 1529 included a hefty 66 pounds to Lady Carey upon an emerald and in 1530 to Christopher the milliner for 154 pearls and an emerald valued at 80 pounds. Gifts at Henry VIII's court included a crimson velvet doublet with emeralds in 1534. In 1545, an English secretary transcribed intelligence from Spain, writing that with regard to the ships that the English have captured of those galleys which left for the Mediterranean for the Atlantic, I wish to speak especially of the ship called San Salvador from Santo Domingo the emeralds you will have sold. 50 years later, in 1593, English intelligence about Spanish cargoes included reports of large chests full of pearls and emeralds, and one loose emerald um, that accompanied bars of silver sent by the Viceroy of Peru. A report of Francis Drake's activities around the Strait of Magellan included intercepting Spanish ships that contained emeralds. Captain Francis, the account goes, and his people came to Puerto San Domingo and found a great crucifix of gold and emeralds which they had taken out of that ship alongside bars of silver, plundering them. So in London, little emerald objects like this one entered into the world of artisanal craft, gift giving, and illicit trafficking. A lady Frank in Westminster asked the lapidary John Crithlow to cut her a small emerald, but Crithlow complained that he received of her lady for cutting the same stone, not worth much more than their cutting cost. In addition to showing how skilled artisans learn to cut emeralds and mount jewelry such as this, we get a glimpse of the demand um, by women for these jewels. Crinthlow had asked to cut one of these stones into an emerald ring, but to take special care in the cutting since it had already cost the lady 10 pounds. For one illegal East India Company sailor who had stolen the cargo of a ship, the safest place to store his most valuable stolen emerald, which he reported to be seven inches in length, was among some old shoes under some stairs in a house in Hockley in the Hole in Clarkenwell Green. When several East India Company agents went in search of the gem, they found the emerald at a Susan Brady's house, um, and again, kind of giving us the sense that women are kind of handling these objects kind of beyond the court as well. So emeralds could be located in the household pockets and jeweler shops of Tudor London, but where were they sourced from? So the emeralds, all the emeralds from the Cheapside Hoard were analyzed and curators found that the pieces all came from the mountainous district of Shivora in the province of Muzo, 65 miles to the northwest of Bogota, Colombia. In the mid-16th century, as Mary the first marriage to Philip II of Spain encouraged England's connections to Spain's imperial reach, 
The Spanish extracted these blue-green emeralds from the mountains of South America, finding stones ranging from the size of a finger or thumb, as kind of reported by the, the East India Company agent, um, to, grum, to crumbs and grains. By the end of Elizabeth's reign, travel literature described the great store of excellent emeralds in diverse parts of the Indies, where could be found the land of the emeralds, which grow in stones like unto crystal. So this seemingly innocuous little object directly links the Americas and, by extension, the enslaved Muso Indians who worked in the mines to English consumption and self-fashioning. In a manuscript known as the Jewel House of Gems, William Heath recorded how in the West Indies there are great store of mines of all sorts, such as in the realms of Peru, and metals, especially gold and silver. In truth, Heath wrote, the Spanish had no knowledge of Potosi nor of the wealth of the mountains of Bolivia until an Indian called Gualpa from a province of Cusco going one day to hunt for venison was forced to lay hold onto a branch which issued from a vein of a silver mine. Finding pieces of metal, he carried it to Porco to trial the metal by fire. It is a fearful thing, Heath continued, and breeds an amazement to think upon it, that so great is the desire of silver and wealth, that for the gain thereof men endure many pains. Truly, it is not without reason that Pliny said, we enter even into the bowels of the earth and go hunting after riches, even to the place of the damned. In the English translation of um, the very popular account, the kind of fueled the Spanish black legend, um, Bartholomew de Las Casas's short account of the destruction of the Indies. Las Casas had written of how the Spanish in Western South America, in the region that is now Bolivia and Peru, found those countries very fertile and full of people, whereas abundance of precious stones, especially emeralds. The conquerors were extremely cruel. They shed human blood without any scruple or remorse. The goods these people had in their possession, he wrote, was the motive that violently prompted the Europeans to persecute and destroy them. The English are very quick to be critical of Spain's method of imperial expansion, um, but they have fewer qualms about reaping the benefits of global travel. So to me, this object is fascinating for a number of reasons. Um, firstly, I mean, it's, it's beautiful. It's a small, pleasing object. It showcases the skill of the artisan who turned a stone into a playful piece of art to wear close to the body. The parrot motif, building on medieval imagery, might indicate carnal love, perhaps it's a love token, but it contains a certain resonance too with Tudor exploration and the growing fascination for birds and feathered artifacts from Central and South America. The stone connects the hands of indigenous peoples to the lives, fashions, and bodies of the Tudors and to other trades and industries such as silver mining. Um, it also connects us to different European ports from whence many American goods flowed before arriving in London from Seville um, and other, other European cities. And it conjures a time, as the um, author Edward, uh, Edward Galliano wrote, when you could build a silver bridge from Potosi to Madrid from what was mined there and one back with the bones of those that died taking it out. Um, so an object like this one opens us up to a world of ships and shipwrecks, where emerald jewels sank into the Pacific seabeds after hurricanes in the Florida Keys, and East India Company merchants smuggling treasure purloined in the Americas and trafficked in Asia. It sheds light on stories in travel literature about Spanish crucifixes and Anglo-Spanish rivalries and the material culture of Aztec and Incan elites. Um, and moving forward, as I continue to kind of look into this area, um, I hope such emeralds might also continue to uncover more stories about resistance to the imperial project as well. Um, after all, it took Spain many decades of conflict to overpower the Muzo and Chipcha people who had mined emeralds for centuries before European travel. Thank you. Thank you, Christina, again, um, and to my fellow panelists. And uh, it's very good to be back at the Paul Mellon Center. Um, very pleased to be here. Um, and I will move on to my chosen object. So for me, um, this remarkable object is a, a useful crystallization and perhaps a kind of culmination of a series of, of Tudor engagements with the global. It's the only surviving example of its kind, um, and it is, as you can see, a letter from Queen Elizabeth I. I mean, her name starts and finishes the document. 
Um, interestingly, it's signed unusually in, in, her, in the Italian style, Elisabetta Regina. Um, and it's written, again, I think as you can hopefully see, to the Emperor of Kataya and dispatched with the experienced Devonshire Sea Captain, Captain George Weymouth, and his crew uh, on May the 1st, 1602. Kataya was a kind of mirage, uh, a kind of fantasy region imagined to the north of China, sort of blending Cathay and China, Kataya, Kathaya, uh, and a place with which China is often elided or connected. And before Weymouth's ships left on their long voyage to East Asia, on the last day of April, uh, this copy was held aloft and read aloud to the assembled members of the new East India Company in London, before it was then carefully folded away with translations in Italian, Latin and Portuguese into a protective tin. The tin still survives, amazingly, alongside what's described as a garnish of English trading goods. Uh, so different types of cloth, nightcaps, gloves and shoes, mirrors, locks, keys, hinges, bolts, maps, books, all designed to showcase English technical ingenuity. And all of this was packed away to withstand the trials of potentially more than a year at sea before they would reach their destination. Hopefully you can tell from the reproduction that the letter um, is as visually stunning now, I think, as it was when it was initially completed. And it's certainly intended to be visually stunning. It's a substantial parchment document. It's about half a metre across, half a metre high. Um, and features, again, as you can see, an elaborate uh, banner border in red with swirls of gold foliage, uh, limbed by a man called William Seeger, who was the Norway King of Arms, and seems to have been something of a specialist in these kinds of letters. He, he did other letters to China and, and other um, decorative letters to other potentates. Uh, and the letter cost the East India Company uh, the princely sum of six pounds, 13 shillings and fourpence to, uh, to decorate. Of course, the Queen never paid for the decoration of her letters. <laughs> um, from these banners, again, you can see at the bottom right and left, hang pearls, um, items which I think uh, aren't there by accident. They hold their value in the global marketplace and were therefore useful, even if only depicted, when you're trying to establish a kind of mutually comprehensible iconography of magnificence. The use of coloured inks in the lettering, gold, red and brown here, um, with an accentuated golden M for each use of the word majesty, is a device I think learnt from the letters that were moving between London and Istanbul from the Anglo-Ottoman correspondence, in which, let in which Elizabeth had received letters in blue, crimson, gold and scarlet inks, written on paper dusted with powdered gold. So here, the English Queen and her court are attempting to intervene in global imperial spheres and are finding an iconography in which they can do so. Uh, something similar, but perhaps slightly less extravagant uh, in terms of decorative scheme can be seen in the surviving letters from Elizabeth to, to Tsar Ivan IV, which are now preserved in the Russian state archives. And letters like this, of course, most of them don't survive because they arrive at their destination and then um, disappear for one reason or another, or they don't arrive at their destination and disappear. Um, but the ones that do survive um, tend to be extraordinarily dec decorative like this. Um, and there were probably many others reproduced in variant forms in the letters that were sent to India, Ethiopia, Morocco, Persia, the Indonesian kingdoms of Java and Aceh, and of course to Istanbul. So lots of letters sent out, very few survive, other than in secretarial copies. This sense of Tudor expansionism, of new diplomatic and commercial horizons, is also apparent on the level of the letter's content. The letter begins with an expansive opening to the great, mighty and invincible, um, but conspicuously unnamed, Emperor of Cathaya. It states that the English are a people by nature inclined to great attempts, and many years past and sundry times since, Elizabeth has tasked her subjects with the finding out of some nearer passage by sea into your majesty's countries through the north and east parts of the world. Many of these letters have never returned, or not being heard of since their departure hence, whereas others have been beaten back by the frozen seas and intolerable cold of, these, of those climates. All of this tells us that this letter was intended to be carried along the Northwest Passage, a sea route that was speculated to lie over the north of what is now Canada and was imagined uh, to be a kind of corridor that would carry English goods and merchants over the top of the globe into Cathaya and to China. 
In the second half of the 16th century in particular, it promised to be England's superhighway to global prominence. Indeed, in the letter, Elizabeth notes that Weymouth leaves with her blessing to find a nearer way of passage between England and Eastern Asia than the usual frequented course, which involves compassing the greatest part of the world, so traveling right the way around the Cape and across the Indian Ocean. The opening up of such a passage could, Elizabeth writes, unite the two monarchs, their countries and their dominions, for it would reveal that they were not so far remote or severed as they are estranged and unknown the one to the other. The arrival of this letter then would realize what Elizabeth calls the opportunity of intercourse of traffic or merchandise between the subjects of both our kingdoms. But Elizabeth goes beyond that and hopes for more. That through this beginning, a mutual league and amity may grow, she says. The prospect of an alliance between Cathaya, part of or at least closely connected to China, which of course was the preeminent power in the early modern global economy, and England, hitherto on the fringes of that economy, is, I think, quite extraordinary. It shows how the English were willing to cast aside conventional geographies of peripherality and rethink the assumptions that their foremost connections were with Europe and the rest of Christendom. A league and amity with Cathaya and ultimately with China, like those already established with Morocco and the Ottoman Empire, would offer a further counterbalance to Spain and to Habsburg Catholic dominance. Um, it's also, of course, a victory for wishful thinking. This was possibly the twelfth letter that had been drawn up, decorated and dispatched for emperors of the East. The letter concludes at the very end with a justification of international trade, which becomes a maxim for Tudor global thinking and follows the model of the very first English letter sent to the, into the far north and to China, written by her brother Edward VI 50 years earlier in 1553. This trade would allow the peoples of Asia to be served with the native commodities of these parts, and in return, we and our subjects would be furnished with things of like service and use. And it was this that was understood to be God's plan in the world from an English perspective, that God had spread the natural resources across the globe in such a way that peoples necessarily had to come together to trade. And out of such mutual benefit, she writes, amity and friendship may grow between us. So Elizabeth looks forward to the receipt of His Majesty's letters to be returned by our said subject and concludes with a tellingly universalist invocation. She commends Your Majesty to the protection of the eternal God whose providence guideth and persevereth, preserveth all kings and kingdoms. But, as you may have already worked out, this letter never arrived, which is why we have it. Um, indeed, no Englishman arrived in China until John Weddell in 1637. Weymouth initially made good progress northward through June of 1602 into the Newfoundland area before the arrival of deep cold on the evening of the 19th of July let, led his crew to mutiny, tie him up, put him below deck, and a storm drove them quickly back to England and the inevitable scrutiny of the court and company investors. So amidst all those recriminations and the court actions in the aftermath of the failure of the voyage, somehow this letter, which had returned with them, mysteriously ended up in the Lancashire Public Record Office in Preston, <laughs> possibly through the hands of a senior naval commander called Robert Cross. And it's there that I've seen it, and you can still see it today, a nearly lost icon of late Tudor global ambition. Thank you, Christine. It's brilliant to be doing this. It really is great. And especially after what we've just heard, I feel I'm going to be rather traditional. I'm both showing a, an image which is, seems very sort of art-based, in effect, if we can just pop it up, um, and is also probably closer to... Sorry, because I'm using that. There you go. It's slightly closer to home in terms of what Lauren um, and Matt have been talking about. So my image uh, is a manuscript depiction of Hagia Sophia in Istanbul. It's dated 1588. Um, it recently appeared, reappeared, having been miscatalogued in the British Library uh, in manuscripts, in the edition manuscript 5234. I didn't find it, Fuchsia Hart uh, or Oxford found it, but um, we were talking about this and I sort of picked up and tried to connect it to other stories about the person who is associated with, um, which is what I'm going to talk about. So it's a very large drawing which was made and signed, uh, quote, by me, Thomas Morgan. He says he's a mariner, having been about 50, above 15 years bound and thrall in the Turkey galleys. You can see across the top that Morgan has emblazoned Elizabeth's motto, Viva Elizabeth, always the same. 
Across the top of the building's dome is written the great temple called Santa Sophia at Constantinople, where the great Turk called Sultan Morat doth inhabit. So the drawing shows, as some of you are probably familiar with, Hagia Sophia, uh, set in its gardens with its distinctive dome, two of the four minarets that were added when Constantinople fell to the Turks in 1453. I'm interested in it because, you know, how do we see it as a piece of art? Because Morgan was neither an elite traveller nor a draftsman. So th there's an interesting question about what its status is. And I think in all the objects that we've been looking at as art artefacts, material objects, this, of course, perhaps seems more uh, the former, but I'm not so sure. So who was Morgan and what was he trying to achieve by drawing Hagia Sophia in this way in 1588? We do know a bit about Thomas Morgan already. He's part of the genre of written captivity narratives, um, which some of you working in this area may know. Um, scholars like Nabil Matar and Rosalind Knutson have worked on already. Rosalind Knutson uh, wrote an article called Elizabethan Documents, Captivity Narratives and the Market for Foreign History Plays in 1996. And that a uh, great piece provided an, an appendix of documents drawn from the parish clerk's records of St. Botolph of Oldgate. And Thomas Harridans, who was the clerk of the parish, kept a detailed day book from 1583 to 1600. And that day book included descriptions of the baptism and deaths of many interesting figures in terms of talking about global lives in Tudor England. Figures like Mary Phyllis, which uh, people like uh, uh, Miranda Kaufman's written about in her book Black Tudors, and her baptism at the same church in 1597. So Harridan's is interesting because of the records that he kept. Um, and he also kept accounts of collections taken for English captives who were captured by the Turks in Eastern European and the Mediterranean. And Harridan's record of the 26th of May, 1588, gives an account of Thomas Morgan. So I'm now trying to marry up the account that we have from that record with this image that Morgan drew. Um, so just a, a sort of snapshot of the account from Harridan's records, uh, which says in 26th of May, 1588, a collection was made for Thomas Morgan, who hath been captived by the infidels, and infidels has been as replaced Hungarians. So this becomes interesting in terms of who the question of who the infidel is. Um, captive by the infidels, presumably the Turks, not the Hungarians, memorandum that Thomas Morgan in the county of Surrey, who had served Her Majesty in her wars in diverse places, um, in the wars in New Haven under Ralph Brown in a ship called the Red Dragon, also in Ireland um, and in diverse other places. And after that served under Sir William Gorge Knight in Hungary, where by infidels he was taken prisoner and above 15 years kept bond and thrall in most cruel slavery and bondage until our loving subject, Edward Cotton Esquire, most charitably redeemed him from the same in consideration whereof he was licensed by Her Majesty's Letters Patent uh, to gather the devotions of well-disposed people within the city of London um, and the town of Norwich. Um, dated the 2nd of May in the 30th year of Her Majesty's reign. There was gathered for him in our parish church uh, the sum of 16 shillings, 7 pence, which had been engrossed upon the letters and delivered to his wife. So well, this is interesting because it gives us a sort of global dimension to a figure like Morgan, a very non-elite traveller, and those connected to him. It seems that his career started as a soldier and a sailor, involved in the ill-fated New Haven or La Havre expedition, uh, of 16, 1562 to 1603 uh, in support of the French Huguenots, uh, which of course failed in 1563. He then fights in Ireland, and then he fights against the Turks in Hungary in the late 1560s under Sir William Gorge, who was Vice Admiral of the Fleet, who also acted as a mercenary in the pay of the Holy Roman Emperor Maximilian II. Presumably this is the point at which Morgan uh, was captured and that his captivity extended throughout the 1570s and led him to Istanbul, where he saw Hagia Sophia. Um, I only say this, uh, uh, sorry, um, presumably his, captive, his captivity uh, lasted this long. What transpired prior to his ransom is unknown. Edward Cotton paid Morgan's ransom. Cotton's interesting because he was a merchant from Southampton with commercial interests in Brazil. The report of his gathering in May 1588 is the last we hear of Morgan, so we know as far as we know. We must assume that it's around this time he draws Hagia Sophia, so there's an interesting question, when is this object actually created? Um, I guess he doesn't do it in Istanbul um, and then brings it back home due to the relatively high quality of the finish. 
So what compels this relatively modest man, a jobbing soldier, held captive for 15 years uh, in Turkey to draw Hagia Sophia? We have written accounts, but very few drawings. And what else can we glean then from that drawing? So I'm cheating a little bit by just giving you a few more details here. Um, so I'm just running you through so you can see. We can look back at this in a minute. Um, the inscription on the left suggests that one of Morgan's main interests is in describing religious practice. He offers a vertical uh, narrative. I'm going back to the main one. He offers a vertical narrative on the left uh, describing religious practice, um, starting with the call to prayer, described in the text next to the left-hand minaret. It says, these that are here to be seen in pinnacles so high do call the people to the church and to that end of try. So here is throughout, there's some attempt, I think, to describe what Morgan sees in rhyming couplets. Um, you know, one wonders, did he write as well as draw this object? It's, it's, it's questionable, we just don't know. Below, he also describes what seems to be prayers uh, within the mosque. And those that herein do remain to Muhammad, they try saying next to the living God that he remains on high. The inscription at the bottom describes wudu, which is the ritual washing before prayers. It says, and those that are here underneath at fountains, they do wash, believing that their sins they clear and gods do refresh. The figures in the windows, fascinating. Um, Trying to offer some kind of account of a religious or a political hierarchy in, label the figures, in labeling the figures in the window. On the ground floor are what he calls jamikas, which are presumably janissaries wearing their distinctive headgear. And above are murad's lords and what Morgan calls the high priest. To the right, just going back to the main piece, he talks he, on the right hand side you have an inscription referring and pra praising Elizabeth. O oh God, confound her secret foes. There's then a line which is quite difficult uh, to transcribe. And give her still the upper hand above all her enemies. Um, so there's a sense in which there's a celebration there of Elizabeth. Interestingly, obviously, at the moment, which is the high point of the Anglo-Ottoman relationship at the time. So who was the image intended for? Was it made as a gift to Cotton for providing the ransom that led to his release? Or was Morgan offering an implicit defense of his captivity? One theological response to the captivity and enslavement suffered by the likes of Morgan was to question the motivation for their actions. John Elmer, who was Bishop of London, wrote in 1582 that it was, quote, strange and dangerous that the desire of worldly and transitory things should carry men so far with such kind of traffic, which neither our ancestors before us knew of, nor can be attempted without selling of souls for purchasing of pelf, to the great blemish of our religion and the shame of our country. You know, one of those standard arguments about expenditure and the loss of the goods of the country and really something that I think all three papers are, are implicitly talking about in some ways. So if individuals like Morgan chose to do so, to travel in this way, then their physical bondage was equally spiritual, a theological trial to be endured by the Christian soul. So was the drawing of I Sophia Morgan's praise of Elizabeth's religious constancy and his own bond and thrall in the Turkish galleys, an attempt to justify his own religious travail? If so, is he one of the many dispossessed individuals caught between two different forms of bondage imposed by those in power and authority, one physical, the other spiritual, and neither of his choosing? Is this why he drew? I don't know, perhaps, but it still doesn't quite explain who received it then or today. Fantastic, thank you. Um, so I think those were all fantastic. I think that was a fantastic group of objects to start us off because they speak to so many different ways in which um, the global uh, permeated Tudor and, um, well, Tudor society, uh, political, religious, but also personal and, and sort of social in the form of the jewel. And then, of course, the different... Um, levels of craftsmanship that that implies as well. So the, the kind of professional gem cutter or the professional illuminator versus the sort of uh, amateur sketcher. Um, so in, in terms of breadth, I couldn't have asked for better. Um, but I wonder if we can um, think a bit about the, the field at the moment and um, what you think are the most exciting developments at the moment, how, how recent scholarship has shifted our understanding of the Tudor globe. 
I don't have a mic, so they've got. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, yeah, I, I can start. I think one thing is that thinking about what a global perspective actually means, you know, and and how we kind of think about connected histories, comparative histories. Um, I suppose thinking about the the difficulties, perhaps, of different languages, um, kind of understanding our positionality in relation to kind of other cultures and, and how we navigate that. Um, one thing that I find quite exciting, and I know not everyone might, but I think the geopolitics and kind of thinking about those, those political um, tensions, the kind of power relations behind the production of art is, is really tantalizing and allows us to think about um, various cultures of making and how they, they come together. Oh, well, I'm just going to cough. Oh, well, you're going to cough. And then you're going to say something. No, you go ahead. Oh, okay. Well, I'm quite curious about how... Uh, is this an ignorant point? Um, I'm wondering how far uh, the, the analysis of visual culture um, is playing catch-up with a lot of the textual studies that's happened over the last 20 years, so the work that's been done, you know, in the field of you know, East-West exchange um, that's been very textual, you know, the work... That both you two have been doing and people have been writing about, you know, mercantile exchange, uh, um, ambassadors, you know, people like Harborn's work and so on and so forth. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering, I mean, your work is sort of, is, is engaging with this to some extent, so you, you also should talk about this in a way. I'm not, I'm not really sure how much, because when we talk about Tudor art, actually, the other issue is it's a massive elephant in the room. What do we mean when we talk mm. about Tudor art? There is no, because then we get into the interesting question of the global and the local mm. and the national, because the, having written a book years ago on Charles I art collection, there is no notion of an English tradition around the art. So what I guess you're hearing here is the way of, you know, we have, none of us have really looked at what you might call a more traditionally artistic object. I suppose mine was the nearest to it. So I think it's interesting that, funnily enough, although there's been so much work on material culture and objects, I don't know in terms of when we talk about Tudor art, yes, later, and the, the European tradition, I think is changing and has, has looked at cross-cultural visual culture. But the Tudor work, I'm not so sure. There you go, Matt. <laughs> no, I think that's exactly right. I, um, I was thinking when I was walking over here, thinking about this very question, um, about the work that's been going on recently around inventories. But that is, I mean, it's not really about Tudor art either, is it? It's about Tudor collections of objects. Um, thinking about Susan Bracken's work, for instance, and um, the ways in which I think in the last decade or two we've become attuned to different kinds of objects in ways that weren't necessarily the case before. I think there's a wider debate going on. It, I didn't really want to mention the word, you know, the sort of wokery de debate around National Trust property and being aware of the kinds of objects that are in collections that wouldn't have necessarily been picked out before but are suddenly open to questions of provenance. And I, I think those sorts of debates are quite interesting because of the way they foreground art objects that wouldn't otherwise have been foregrounded. Mm. Can I have one? Thank you. Um, yeah, I think I, I was kind of recently asked if I thought that there was a, like an, imper an imperial aesthetic, you know, in the, the kind of Tudor or Jacobean period. And there certainly isn't a kind of imperial or colonial one in the way that we might think about la later 17th or of course 18th century work. And so it's kind of, is there not one earlier or have we just not thought about how we kind of conceptualize that or talk about it. I guess your book, Elizabethan Globalism, kind of, you know, thinks about that a little bit mm -hmm. from, from the perspective of thinking about empire in a way that's, you know, might encompass colonialism, but also encompasses these other ideas about sovereignty and, you know, cross-cultural engagement and, and other kind of empires in the East. Well, I want to ask you, can I, well, because of what you've been doing, and you know the field in a way better, but, you know... It also connects to what's going on, you know, the notion of the sort of what I call the theological Brexit that happens in the Tudor period, you know, in 1570, Elizabeth's excommunication, and really from the 1550s, England is cut off from the continental <laughs> high, high traditions artistically. You know, so there's a problem there about exactly how cross-cultural encounter takes place. Is this, is this me? 
it's interesting what you were saying at the end about trying to avoid, you know, you just kind of jump the, the Tudors jump into the periphery. Mm. They just cut out Europe. And I mean, that's quite funny because it is, it's very Brexit. It, it, it feels very much about the way in which they're related. Yeah, we've got a trade deal with Cathay, so, you know. <laughs> so we're good, we're good, you know, absolutely great. But it is, and, it and is. And the polar in, ice is melting. Yeah. So we can yeah. get over the north. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. But we know this, it's not until sort of 1611, 12, 13, when you've got people like Arundel and Ninigo Jones who are getting to Italy going, We've just missed out on the high renaissance. Blimey, look at this stuff. And you know, they bring back Titians and it's like they've come from outer space. <laughs> so when you've got that going on, to then trace the wider, what we are talking about, the global, which I still don't think we know what we mean when we talk about the global. It's such a silly. I mean, you know, do we, what do we mean by that? It's vaguely international. There are things from the new world. What do we mean by that? You know, we, we need to give it a bit more heft rather than just sort of muddling around on the edges. But you know, you, you know, you sit in that field in terms of what we traditionally call as Tudor art. So I'd be interested to see what you say about it. Yeah, well, okay, there's so much there. Um, I think just on that point, yes, I think it's true that Tudor art is playing catch up. I mean, as we, as we saw in the previous uh, round table, for those of you who were here, or you can watch it later online, um, the, uh, it's only relatively recently that people have A, acknowledged that there was any art in Tudor England at all, foreign or otherwise, um, because of sort of prejudices about the Reformation having held firm throughout a lot of the 20th century. Um, and then beyond that, you know, actually thought of asking interesting questions about it. So it's not just a case of antiquarian kind of discovery and listing and, and you know, um, yeah, description, uh, and actually thinking, okay, how does this fit into other theoretical moments, um, and what else can we say about it? So I think, yes, it's playing catch up, but that's why we're here, <laughs> mm. trying to drag uh, Tudor art history into the 21st century. Um, something you were saying, Lauren, about this idea of um, imperial iconography, and a, a phrase that you had, which I wrote down because I liked it so much, mutually comprehensible iconography of magnificence. Um, I think actually when we, I think we do find that at least earlier in the 16th century, but where we find it is in um, Henry VIII looking to Turkish um, imperial dress, and I mean there's this portrait of him possibly based on a Holbein which is of him wearing a Turkish uh, overcoat effectively um, and that kind of uh, him sort of embracing this reputation that he had as a you know the new Turk um, because he'd had lots of wives um, so you know I think um, it struck me as well with your object that the the pearls but also these sort of um, so-called arabesque ornaments in the borders you know they're writing to what we would think of as China, but they're using Ottoman yeah. decorative repertoire to show that they are a sort of generic foreignness, or is there something else going on there that it, it's deemed both um, exotic, in inverted commas, but, but also somehow elaborate, imperial, exciting? Um, yeah. I'm thinking about Henry VIII parading around in his clothes, which I love. There, there are plenty of references to it, as we know, mm. that he travels across London, goes to mass, attends weddings dressed as the Turk, he's that famous painting where he's wearing the kind of caftan. Well, I still can't quite work out in my head whether I think that's him playing a kind of exotic dress up, as you were suggesting. Whether there's a kind of political charge there that he's having himself painted dressed as the Turk to make a political point about you know, uh, Ottoman-French relations that had begun in the 1530s, about opposition to Habsburg dominance. So it's a kind of European power play. Um, or whether it's, uh, I suppose what its meaning is for Henry, I mean, it's something we'll never recover, but wh why, what happens when a monarch dresses up as a Turk in the 1530s when there's no direct contact between England and Turkey? Don't look at me. <laughs> I have no idea what he's well, doing. I, I think it's something very different than when, say, Elizabeth I receives a suite of Turkish women's dress um, f as a gift from the Ottoman court. Um, there's a very, there's a suddenly a very different dynamic. Mm. Um, well, yeah, we knew that from the ambassadors. So, you know, mm. you know one of the great contexts, I mean, if we, people writing about this, I wrote about this with Lisa Jardine 20 years ago. You know, the context is the failed, it's the collapsed Franco-Ottoman alliance, uh, Franco-Tudor uh, Ottoman alliance, which is about to be signed at that point. And that's the assumption that that's what that image shows. So embedded within it, of course, the Turkish carpet, which is there, and certain, you know, implicit, you know, implicit signs and symbols gives you an indication that that's what happened. It doesn't come off, 
the pact falls apart, the painting gets literally shelved. You know, and the, the image that we have of the Moroccan ambassador, I think is the same moment. It's a moment of what you expect is about to happen, an Anglo-Moroccan alliance which is about to be signed in late 1600, early 1601, for various reasons which are not, you know, the orientalist arguments of, you know, oh, we can't have a deal with, you know, the barbarian, you know, Moroccans is not what's going on, but it does fall apart, so the picture literally gets shelved. You wonder with a similar thing, you know, with, with Henry, what is that moment about? Yeah, and is it just also a, a power play? It's about, a, it's about, you know, it is an attempt to assimilation, isn't it? I can dress in their clothes, therefore I have more power. But then we know that they're probably, they're probably two seasons out of date. So actually, <laughs> it's not. It's Henry, actually, he's trying to play, play catch up. You don't really know, but that's how I've always read those moments. You found all that stuff anyway. Hmm. So, all right, so when these objects do come to um, England, whether they are gifted by uh, an emperor or whether they come by perhaps slightly more circuitous routes, how do you think patrons um, and viewers regarded these objects? Do you think they were aware of their origins or do you think they had any sort of knowledge about where they came from? How much travels with, with the object? Yeah, I mean, this is just going to be another, like, I, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> I mean... On one hand, I think, and as I kind of wanted to mention a little bit with the emeralds, like there is knowledge about where these goods come from. It isn't just like someone's like, oh, I had no idea that enslaved people had to collect these pearls that we, you know. So there is an understanding of those kind of commodity chains and where goods are coming from because there's so much travel knowledge that's circulating. I mean, we've kind of devoted our entire careers to looking at that, but that, you know that that there is a lot of information about. Um, where objects are sourced and the kind of consequences of that. I mean, there's a great, a great quote, um, a chaplain, James the first chaplain, so I'm cheating by looking slightly later, but um, his uh, sermon that's preached at court in the kind of 1610s, I think, and he basically says, you know, the well-dressed courtier is basically clad in goods that indigenous peoples have had to produce for him, whether or not that's the pearls, um, the silks, the gold, the silver, this is all kind of, the, the figure of the courtier is kind of created through this patchwork of different kinds of labor and, and non-European knowledge. Um, but how much do people, how much is that self-fashioning part of how we read a portrait or a kind of image? This is what I, I kind of, you know, it's in the same way that we know that iPhones are created in, you know, conditions that we probably don't want to think, of. you know, so, so how much is that self-fashioning part of it, so it's kind of look at the access that I have to these goods, even if they come at the expense of other people, and how much is that not part of what, what the viewer is supposed to think about a, a monarch or a, a painting when they look at it? I mean, I don't know what, hmm. what you think. I, I was thinking about the, um, I mean, there are a number of, of kind of broadsides against courtiers wearing foreign fashions, when they describe described as foreign fashions, no barbarian sleeves and so on, and Turkish mustachios that go in and out of fashion. Uh, and they're basically told that they're nothing better than dogs in doublets, which I've always enjoyed as a sort of insult. But I, for me, I think there's a change over the course of the 16th century, but even over the course of, of Elizabeth's century, I think if we're, if we're, I mean, I, I appreciate Joey's point about what, what are we talking about when we're talking about the global, but if we think about the 1550s as a key point for England's expansion into new markets with Henry the, with Edward VI and the search for the Northwest and Northeast Passages and beginning to write letters to the Emperor of China as a, as a sort of origin point for a, a commercial expansionism. Then I think the goods that return from that commercial expansionism um, are treated in a very different way than the ones that start to arrive as part of a kind of bulk trade interaction that develops around about 1600 or the early part of the 17th century. Uh, and you can see that by the way that they are treated, the way that they're mounted, the way they seem to have been displayed. Um, Robert Cecil, who I've written about, um, his initial collection of porcelain, the porcelain is taken to an English silversmith and mounted in very specific ways with kind of classical motifs. Um, he seems to have jettisoned all of that when everybody else started to do it and started to focus on acquiring unadorned porcelain as the kind of fashionable, more difficult to get Items. So I think there's a sense that as the volumes of trade change, as the roots of trade change, tastes change and also elite ch tastes change in reaction to popular tastes. So there's a kind of 
a sequence of complex interconnections there. Sounds good. <laughs> well, I, I suppose for me, I'm thinking of the, um, you know, the John D. scrying mirror, which we now know was from the obsidian mines of mm -hmm. Mexico. Um, and the fact that he used that for sort of um, spiritual purposes or attempted spiritual purposes, the fact that actually in Aztec culture it had um, associations with the spirit world, it see, I mean, it could be a coincidence um, or something to do with the material suggesting things like that, but it just seems like sometimes, um, you know, not just the mode of production, but also the cultural value of these things possibly travelled um, with them. Um, I mean, it would be really interesting to know whether the kind of porcelain that William Cecil valued was actually the hardest to get or the, mm. the most valuable. Or, you know, was he buying stuff that they were making for export and not know it, you know, not having that um, understanding. Mm. So, yeah, I suppose thinking also about cultural value as well as, um, you know, the mode of production. Yes, and it's certainly the case that China is a label attached to many things that clearly didn't come from China. <laughs> so, I think, uh, I mean, th there's been some arguments that suggest that there's a big, with the cabinets of curiosity, which we haven't mentioned yet, and, and the kinds of collections we're talking about, uh, that there's the kind of beginnings of something like a kind of connoisseurship in England in the later part of the 16th century. But it's a connoisseurship that's kind of floundering in the dark. They don't really know what it is they're talking about. They don't really know the provenance of these items because most of them, certainly in terms of Chinese goods, come from captured Portuguese ships. So, you know, you just pay for whatever you can get and then you say, yes, of course, this comes from China. Here, see it on display in my drawing room. Yeah, I, uh, Laura. No, I just, I wanted to bring in one of my favorite examples, which is um, a, Peddler, so a gentleman, a kind of country gentleman, sees a peddler walking around on a kind of summer's evening, and he's he's wearing an Indian hat that he says he, he and so the the man writes to Robert Cecil again and kind of says, this man has this Indian hat which I think must have been taken from the West Indies, um, in in a in a conflict um, in in the expedition by uh, Francis Drake. Um, so already there's a sense of, okay, this is a valuable object that shouldn't be in the hands of this, this peddler kind of wandering around the countryside, and the Secretary of State should kind of know about this. Um, but the really great thing is that a few weeks later, there's another letter that Cecil receives from this man who kind of says, oh, so about that Indian hat I wrote to you about, um, it, it turns out it's not actually from the West Indies, it's from London, um, and it seems to have been made there. So. Then you kind of get all these other questions about are these like knockoffs, you know, that people are making, yes. and then there is that sense of the elite still kind of want access to the real thing, you know, they yes. want the real feathers that were taking the action of the Indian king. They yeah. don't want the kind of, um, you know, imitation object that was made in Jeep's side. Dyed pigeon feathers, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you reckon Cecil's just fed up and gets all these letters going, not another letter about a global object, which I have to answer. Well, wasn't that, there's the, the shipwreck, the Portuguese yeah. shipwreck, off the south coast and then he sort of all the um he, when robert cecil's going down to try and secure the goods on this thing and he said everyone he meets on the way stinks of perfume because they've just crammed <laughs> crammed this stuff into their pockets um and other orifices apparently. Well, <laughs> nice <laughs> Um, okay, so, so we've got imported objects and, and things coming to England, but besides um, actual physical movement of, of things from far away to nearby, how else might we trace the influence of um, Tudor exposure to other cultures in material and visual culture? I think that's a difficult question to answer. <laughs> <laughs> Traditionally, though, yeah. it's been, well, some of this analysis has been done through carpets and fabrics, hasn't it? There was, there was a, a big vogue uh, quite a long time ago now to identify carpets in Renaissance art, and to the extent that you could identify the weave and place them in specific places. Um, I think f there's a lot of work going on now about fabrics and trying to identify the provenance of particular fabrics or the styles that, that are being reproduced, but it is very hard, I think. Yeah, and, not, and as we were kind of saying before, the fashions change so fast yeah. that, that even when you kind of recognize it in a portrait, for example, you're still kind of wondering, like, is this meant to kind of be seen as outdated by now? Um, you know, is this actually produced in the regions that we think it was? Um, but yeah, I think, I mean, this is something that I've been thinking about um, with the work I've been doing with the National Portrait Gallery, but it's just how you can look at 
the objects, the various objects in a painting, but also um, so things like the rugs, um, the jewelry, the pearls, but also um, dyes, I guess, are another useful way through technical analysis and things, because when you find something like cochineal dye, then you, you, know, you know that's come from Central America, um, and that is a very tangible, we can kind of speculate about where various jewels come from, but things like the dyes, you, you know there's like a little piece of some beetles that were crushed um, in South America that are inside a portrait of Titian or something. Absolutely, and obviously ultramarine as well, you know, from Afghanistan, Afghanistan. yeah. And the, and the fact that it was from Afghanistan being part of its value, that it, you know, it had this cachet of, oh, that's close to Eden, so, you know, it's, it's a slightly more heavenly pigment than azurite, which is just from Germany. Yeah. And, and gold and silver leaf, I mean, obviously the silver leaf is probably, again, coming from kind of colonial context currencies. Um, I guess for me the struggle is also how you read absences in things as well. So we, f we find lots of goods that are being treasured that are coming from Persia or the Ottoman Empire. Um, you don't see indigenous headdresses and kind of Tudor art even though they're collecting them. So then it, the question is kind of why not? And if it's a, it, can you prove a kind of deliberate act of erasure? You know, because I do think there's something to be said here about the English conception of civility and the fact that that civility hinges on kind of access to the imperial greatness of kind of Asian territory. Um, they also kind of juxtaposing that civility against the supposed kind of savagery of those people that the English are in the process of attempting to colonize at the same time. So do you think we can um, attitudes towards other cultures in the use and sort of valuation or otherwise of, of the objects? Of the objects themselves? Um, well, yeah, I guess so. I mean, yeah, I guess we, we can all give examples of where we think. I guess what Matt was saying about, you know, the Henry VIII example, you know, mine from when I wrote Orient Isle was discovering... Uh, is a, a story um, of Hardwick Hall uh, in Derbyshire, um, has a tapestry called Fides, which is of Elizabeth I and the first depiction of the Prophet Muhammad from the 1580s. And I drove up there once with my kids and I was cooking ice cream and I walked in and I went, why do you have an embroidery of the Prophet Muhammad here? And it's a bit like your, the, the Lancashire story, you know, there it was in Derbyshire. Um, and what you see is an image of Elizabeth with a prostrate figure of uh, what seems to be the Prophet Muhammad uh, labelled as so and also with the Al-Quran, so with a, a copy of the Quran and what seems to be a representation of a mosque in the background. Now how do you read that? Do you say this is a representation or a reflection or a response to an Anglo-Islamic relation that we didn't really know about 40, 50 years ago, but now is very much the center of the field. So we now know that Anglo-Ottoman alliance is a very, very significant part of Elizabethan foreign policy. Um, do we say it's a reflection of that, or do we say, again, it's trying to play games, claiming that reformed Protestant theology is triumphing over an image of Islam? And we know that the, the, you know, the narratives or the claims around uh, conversions, you know, Matt's done more work on this than most people, but we know that of all the conversions that were going on, it was mainly Protestants who were converting to Islam in the Mediterranean, rather than any Muslims who were converting to Anglicanism, of which we have one example from the 1580s and that's it. So you look at that image and you think again, what is going on here? Are we seeing a nascent emergence of a sort of Protestant imperial you know, iconography? Um, is it more of a response in a confused way to an alliance? And what the heck is it doing in Derbyshire? And I, you know, I tend to feel, I don't know, it's odd. I suppose our training and our, our, our more conservative history tells us that it's always already a symbol of visual Western iconography, which is triumphing over a sort of aniconic representation of Islam. But maybe what we're hearing, and I think that kind of what you're doing is saying, maybe we need to think much more carefully about what those images are doing these days. And I think your work more on the New World stuff is perhaps doing that. Um, but also you can talk to that as well. Yeah, thinking about that Harvard Hall image, it is, it, it's is—it's an odd kind of, it seems almost anomalous. And then you realize that there's, there's something very similar in the margins of the English prayer book from that period 
that's probably elaborated and copied into the yeah. tapestry in Hobbit Hall. Uh, and then you start to think, well, why is the image of the Prophet Muhammad being crushed by a figure of a female personification of faith in the English prayer book? Um, and it opens up a different way of thinking, I think, about the way in which the Anglo Ottoman relationship worked, because um, we discussed this many times before, but um, on the level of faith, uh, as, in, as in the letter I was talking about, everything becomes, in the correspondence, everything becomes very universal. The eternal God bless you, and, and so on. Whereas any discussions in England about Islam specifically maintain, without question, that it is a damnable religion that um, is infernal and, and so on, and, and should be crushed. And how those two things coexist in England in the period that you were talking about, Jerry, that the kind of height of anglo ottoman relations between, say, 1580 and the mid-1590s, it is very peculiar. It, it comes back to that question about elites and popular culture and the way in which um, English elites seem to have been able to quite easily negotiate some of these contradictions uh, in ways that a popular culture wasn't allowed to. Or True, didn't although this, to. this sort yeah. of tells a lie to that a little bit because it doesn't have that sort of very anti-Turkish Islamic tradition. It's quite descriptive in many ways. Um, so it's interesting because from a non-elite figure, you know, I, I gave a version of this and played around with post-colonial scholar Gatry Spivak sort of famously in the 80s said, you know, can the subaltern speak? And I was saying, can the subaltern draw? This is interesting as a non-elite figure and of course an Englishman who's a captive at that point who very much feels that he would be the subaltern. At that point, the power of the Ottoman, you know, polity is very much that he is, he is the subaltern, you know, he is the, he is the minor figure there. Um, so to represent that in this way is kind of interesting because mm. it doesn't give you the sort of, you know, the vituperative account of Islam, you know, it's not. No. Um, so again, so I think that's interesting in terms of these different regimes that we talk about, the visual culture, who's producing the work and why. I still don't know. I have no idea. Why. I don't understand this image, why I'm so fascinated by it. Just, uh, just adding to that, yeah, I mean, this is a great example, because I, I went to a talk recently about kind of sailors drawings in the kind of 18th century for the, on board kind of East India Company ships and these kind of amateur artists like actually just produce so much beautiful artwork and then you kind of think oh that's really annoying that we don't have that for an earlier period but then we actually kind of do in some examples so there and I'm thinking also of the Drake manuscript so a, a kind of anonymous artist who traveled with Francis Drake during his circumnavigation in 1577 to 1580 and left behind all these drawings of flora and fauna um, and there's lots of indigenous peoples being depicted in that. Um, they're kind of shaking trees to kind of get the birds to fly out of them to collect the feathers that fall down. Um, there's a really poignant image of an enslaved African diver who's kind of swimming away from this large kind of manta ray in the water. Um, and so it, it might kind of be quote unquote bad art from a kind of aesthetic perspective, but on the other hand, mm -hmm. it's kind of opening up so many other perspectives in which we can approach this material. I think that's something we see with the John White drawings as well, sort of, say, you know, can the subaltern speak? Well, it, it's such a complex issue whether, because there were so many different people involved in that, obviously the John White drawings were primarily produced from a, quote, propagandistic perspective to try and persuade investors back home that there was all this stuff that could be, you know, <laughs> grabbed. Um, but. But also, you've got Thomas Harriet, you've got John White himself, you know, genuinely curious about these cultures, it seems, trying to learn the language, trying to communicate with the people, um, which adds a, a big layer of complexity as to what those images really are showing. You know, is it entirely about um, sort of getting one over on the natives, or is it actually about trying a, a sort of early ethnographic impulse? I mean, the John White drawings are so beautiful. They're so, I mean, I, I saw, I was lucky enough to kind of see them in person at the British Museum a few years ago um, with Dr. Stephanie Pratt, and who, who's um, a, a kind of cultural ambassador for the Code Creek Dakota, and being there in the room with her and kind of looking at those objects and discussing them, and the more you look at them, the more you can start to see kind of non-European cycles of kind of thinking about, you know, the, the kind of circularity of some of the images, and the fact that there's almost no European objects in any of, the, you know, there's the one image of the, of the um, girl kind of holding the, doll. the Elizabethan doll. Mm. Um, but other than that, it's, it's, you know, they are portraits. 
Um, and their portraits that in some ways should be sitting alongside other kind of Tudor and, and early Jacobean portraits. Great. So um, if uh, we're thinking then about sort of particularly the West and the way that uh, Tudor um, explorers were approaching the New World, how do artworks fit with wider narratives about England's colonial ambitions in this period? <laughs> think about the New World. Well, or, or the East. I think, um, so the work I've been doing at the, at the moment, um, do you mention the book I'm working on? Well, I'm not really working on John. Well, he is the first, he goes further north uh, for, as a European than anyone had been before. Gets quite close to, uh, to the kind of upper reaches of Greenland. Um, and he is unusual because he, is, he seems absolutely fascinated in Inuit language and returns um, Richard Hacklett in his Principal Navigation, a great collection of English voyages. Uh, he reproduces in that volume huge amounts of Inuit vocabulary uh, with kind of rough translations, uh, as well as accounts of his voyages. He, he takes three voyages up into that region and later travels to the, to the East and West Indies. Um, what struck me when I was thinking about it in the context of our discussion was the way in which moments, um, which we tend to call encounter, for better or worse, moments of encounter, um, like Davis arriving at the tip of Greenland, um, calling out to try and br bring, bring indigenous peoples in, they arrive in canoes, um, he, they start playing instruments and dancing the English to try and attract the Inuit in. And then there's an exchange of goods. They, they give English items and they receive items in return. And it's the same tale in, in every equivalent moment that I've seen. Certainly for Frobisher and Davis, all, all of these uh, voyages into the Northwest all begin with the, the exchange of goods. And the English, of course, think that to some extent they're giving away things of small value and getting things in return of greater value. Or indeed that these exchanges are a kind of preliminary step towards accessing something of greater value, whether it's precious stones or, or anything else. But um, one of the things that crops up again and again is a fasc and this is a slightly weird digression, I admit, is a fascination with the canoe as a kind of technical marvel. Everybody writes about canoes. Every picture you have about a, ca a cabinet of curiosity has a, an, an indigenous canoe. Um, again, perhaps we're thinking slightly different ways, in, in slightly the wrong way about what we think of as indigenous art and the way in which it was appraised from a, a kind of European perspective. Because the things that, they, that were collected and valued and brought back wouldn't necessarily fit the normal definition of, of art and yet were displayed as such and were held as such. I mean, the, the first English voyages to West Africa in the 1550s um, return with cargoes of pepper, some gold and ivory that they don't quite know what to do with and they bring back a vast elephant skull huge, it takes four men to carry it, and they put it on display in central London, and people from all over the city are allowed to come and, and gape at it. Um, and it's, the, it, I mean, it's not art in the conventional sense, is it? But um, it shows something of the way in which objects that were brought from distant locations were, were displayed, understood, thought of, used as a way of articulating something about the wider world. Sorry, that was a bit no, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> The question then for me is just, you know, are these gifts? Are these taken? You know, so yeah. how, there's already that, that story of collecting and how, and, and I think it's, it's very tricky because I think sometimes these objects were gifts. Yeah. Um, and so it, it's, it's almost too easy to kind of just say they were all taken by conquest because that does risk kind of stripping away a sense of um, agency and kind of cultural value that, you know, indigenous peoples are, are giving to um, to these objects that they want Europeans to have. They can be subversive as well. Um, Jack Davy at the British Museum, he works on a later period, but looking at the way that um, indigenous groups in, in North America, on the West Coast, for example, would um, carve kind of almost anti-colonial kind of messages or stories onto canoes that they then gift to put on display. So, you know, how do we get to that yeah. That kind of understanding of the, the function of these mm -hmm. these these artifacts or these these art objects, when we don't we have so little written by um, these peoples, we have such little evidence left of kind of the intentions behind mm -hmm. them, and I think that is a, a huge obstacle in kind of how we build a kind of global picture of of Elizabethan art. Yeah. 
do we want to buy into the colonial discourse narrative as well, though? That's one of the issues, because we're so tied to some notion that we have to say this is going to lead to what we see later in the 17th, 18th century. And I wonder whether that's true. I wonder whether we, we see too much to a, a sort of you know, very, very limited argument about plantations in the new world. And beyond that, everything that goes eastwards, there's no notion about colonial projects. Okay? So there's nothing. There's nothing about what's happening with the Ottomans, with the Barbary states, with anything to the east of the Cape of Good Hope, which is about plantations or colonial settlement. It's purely a new world narrative. And even that is just disastrous. So we were doing this in literary studies you know, decades ago. People, oh, the Tempest is a sort of representation of colonialist discourse. How, you know, Tudor England is always already going to become this great imperial power. Not really. No. We don't have to buy into that. And of course, at the moment, it's very tricky, I think, with the culture wars argument that there's a need again to talk about, say, the issue of slavery. You know, and it's really difficult, you know, so it's not a plug or anything, but just having done a radio series about other Tudors and these kind of questions about the globalised moment in the 16th century and where England was, which was nowhere. It was just a spit. It was, a, it was just a, something on the corner, of, you know, the periphery of everything. So I mad stuff about China. It's interesting. Oh, yeah, we're making all these claims, and nobody knows who we are. The Chinese <laughs> or the Turks, they know we are. So I, I worry about how we make that argument and do we give too much agency to that visual culture that says it's already laying down a story about colonial uh, claims to territory to the sort of subjugation of other peoples and I'm not so sure because until you get really the joint stock companies that start you know East India Company but then you know the Virginia Company really it's a much more of a Jacobean and Caroline moment and I'm sorry, this is the next project, right? Mm. So presumably, nobody talks about this, about what's happening in that period in the sort of 1620s, 30s, 40s, because then it just gets taken over by civil war narratives. And that's the next project. Yeah. Mm. But, you know, it is interesting around how we go Tudors, and we want, to, we want to extract so much from the Tudors around an early colonial project. I'm not so sure we should. I think we should be saying, you know, this was much more, you know, very hit and miss. It was very contingent. There's a kind of hit and miss nar narrative. We can extract some of that material from people like Dee, from some of Elizabeth's letters. You know, Elizabeth writes to Murad and says, you know, I'm the great defender of the faith and I own half of the Western world. And it's like, no, you're not. You're just telling porkies. <laughs> you know, she says she, you uh, know, defender of the faith in Ireland, France, not so much. You know, those claims are, you know, need to be called out as, yes, it's a claim, but it's a pretty empty and hollow claim. Um, and so I wonder what, whether we just put too much on the visual culture to say, here is mm. a kind of colonial project which we see emerging. Maybe not, not so much. But we're so enthralled to reading backwards and saying it has to be there. And maybe the Tudors are not the moment to look for it. Well, I think that in the 1580s, that is, and, and things like John White's drawings, you do get a sense that you're on the cusp of kind of things go either way. so many different <laughs> ways. You know, like, and there, there's a sense even in... I mean, I find Thomas Harriet's text in which these images are later printed, you know, really interesting because on one hand, they are divided into the commodities we can get from here, the commodities that will be useful. I mean, the word commodity comes up again and again and again, and that is, you know, that is part of the colonial project. Um, but as you say, I mean, there, there isn't any guarantee that, that that colonial project will be successful at that point. Point. Um, and so the, the kind of 60s, 70s, 80s, um, it's difficult to kind of get back at them without thinking about what we know from a later period. Um, I mean, saying that, I think there's no getting around the, the kind of the trauma that indigenous peoples today still kind of associate with that very first moment because they do see that as the, the kind of moment where you know, thing, the intervention really started to come and continued to come after that. Mm. I think there's an interesting work going on at the moment as well about, that suggests that there is no single colonial model, that the Spanish had a model, the Portuguese had a model, the English were working between and around those models, but were also coming into contact with <laughs> models of what an imperium looks like. Um, there's that recent book on conquistadors by Cervantes, recent, uh, which suggests that Actually, people misunderstand the Spanish colonial model, um, and in fact, it's it's essentially a medieval yeah. idea of empire transplanted into the new world, in which indigenous peoples may have had more rights than they would have had under under the Portuguese model, which was more commercially and evangelically oriented. 
and the English seem to sort of swerve in, in and out of those two potential models, whilst also keeping in mind the Ottoman model, which is something totally different. So. Well, it's the great book by Patricia Seed, Ceremonies of Possession, yeah. from like the 1990s, great book, where she says, you know, all the European powers make different claims, and, and that's why you have a lot of the collisions between them, because the Portuguese use mapping, and then the Spanish say, we don't recognise your claim, because we're, we're talking about something completely different, hence the collision. It's a great book, Ceremonies of Possession. And yeah, the, the, about the English being caught between, we're, we're all about settling gardens. Well, plant, well, that is why I think yeah, plantation. plantation is actually quite a useful and an important concept and needs to be brought into that discussion of what is empire, what is colonialism, what is plantation, where do they intersect and when, they, when are they different? Because often, you know, country house poetry is about plantation. Um, and, and of course, plantation kind of starts with Ireland before it kind of moves elsewhere. Okay, so before we open the floor to questions, one last question for the panel, which is uh, if Tudor Art's playing catch up, what, what would you like to see next? You know, where should Tudor Art go in terms of the hazily defined global? <laughs> it's got to be collaborative work. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I think Absolutely. we'll all say this, that um, you need to be work. Well, it's then interesting, isn't it, about the current political situation, how difficult it is when I say things like, we need to be working with Turkish historians while Erdogan's arresting them. You talk about trying to work with North African you know, scholars as well. You try and talk about working with people you know, from the Lebanon. It's a real problem. But I mean, I think that you know, we need to have a model more like the social sciences or even the sciences because you know, we, you've all heard this from me before, but you know, the notion that we're all taught through the Greco- uh, Roman Latin tradition, none of us speak Arabic and none of us have Turkish, you know, we're not doing that kind of work and we should be because I think until we do that, I'm going to, be, I'm going to say a lot of this work remains Orientalism mm. and until we start having different voices in collaborative work which is crossing languages and different visual cultures which would then perhaps have people, you know, from those different cultures going, oh, well actually what I'm seeing with this is something completely different. So I think until you get that, you're still going to be, I think, pussyfooting around a little bit, and that's what I'd like to see. But it's really hard to do, and it's about research council funding, and it's about working, you know, for trying to build those kind of networks with scholars who are prepared to do it as well. And, and that's what I'd like to see. And I've stopped doing this work now. I won't do it anymore because I don't have the languages, and I don't have those contacts and contexts within those situations. But it's what Edward Said warned us about back in 1978. You know, there's a point where it's about representation of others and that's really problematic so sorry that's my slightly polemical thing about where we should be going this work has done a huge amount in the last 30 years massively it's transformed the field but it's very much come from what we might lazily call the west or the anglo-american tradition rather than taking it seriously about how you do cross-cultural work across different cultures yeah on that point money yeah put, putting putting the money for your mouth is because you do need to build relationships of trust with the kind of communities you're working with and that doesn't happen overnight and the number of times you come across um, applications for funding and it's just kind of like the turnaround is very quick it's kind of expectations you're going to have outputs and kind of information within kind of a year or you know within a couple years and especially when working with kind of historically invaded or colonized peoples they're not as you say, it's if they want to work with us yeah. in the first place. Yeah. Um, and so it, it takes time to build those trust-based relationships that would bring, I think, greater understanding and conversation and, and um, the, the levels of interpretation that we need. Um, I suppose also it's, I mean, we were talking a little bit about mixed media or cultural translate, uh, transmission. Um, so many times when I was researching my first book, I kind of came across an image and I was like, oh my gosh, this shows that the English are really interested in um, indigenous peoples, there's this kind of woodcut or something. And then it always came from like Holland or from Spain. It had always been published in like earlier from a different kind of European or colonial power. And so it's also, do we even understand how images are talking to each other? Mm -hmm. We do a little bit, I think, with, with kind of texts and, and particular iconographies, but I think there's a lot more to do about artists and, and practices, processes around um, printing and kind of studios and the way that the English are, are speaking to Europeans about these, these kind of global encounters. And then the last thing I would quickly say is, um, I guess thinking a little, continuing to think outside of the canonical as well, um, even just their wonderful Elizabethan paintings in 
um, you know, museum collections in the States, for example, um, and that are quite unfamiliar to a lot of us because we, we just kind of look at, you know, the, the ones that are perhaps most easily accessible or the ones that we kind of see because we're, we're in London and we have access to museums in London. But I think there's a lot more thinking about objects and things and dyes in, in portraits and in paintings from the Elizabethan era beyond kind of Henry and Elizabeth and, and the monarchs that we've kind of been yeah. speaking about. Yeah, I completely agree with both. I, I, the only thing I'd add would be um, carrying on the work that's already going on about opening up collections and opening up archives. There, yeah. There's still a lot of work to be done. I mean, Jerry's written about this far more than I have, of, of accessing collections that should be publicly available that aren't. There's a lot of work in digitization going on in the National Archive and, of course, of early modern books that allow us to, to cover much more material, to make connections between material that weren't, wasn't possible before. Um, but there's still huge archives related to this period that are really uncatalogued and, and uh, unexplored. So I think there's a lot more work to be done there too. Yeah, and so this room, I mean, you just look at the room and you think about what we're talking about and you think that will have to change. It will have to change. It's just going to have to change. Well, you know, it's going to be... This happened with feminism. You know, Natalie Zeman Davis will talk about this, about, you know, opening up the archive when women were doing that work. And, of course, then the materials look completely different. Mm. It's about who's doing that work. Mm. And at the moment, you know, we would all say that, I guess, you know, when, you know, when she does it basically, you know, white Westerners who've been doing this work. And that, that encounter with the archive and who's doing it needs to change. Well, on that note, <laughs> let's do a little bit to diversify and ask the room if there are any questions. Also, online, Rachel, do you want to start? Yeah, yeah fantastic. fantastic. Actually, um, there's a question that's come up that um, launches straight off of that point where someone was asking if there are any kind of black early modern historians um, whose work you could share or reference to, um, just for the interest of the room. Just on the panel with Dennis Britton, who's done some amazing work on conversion recently. Mm. Um, and is, yeah, I would highly recommend. Um, on Yekka Nubia is another yeah. workshop in uh, England's other countrymen and um, black and white is his, his work. Um, Kim Hall, I mean, the work of Kim mm. Hall, every time I go back to it, I'm just blown away. Um, and, you know, that came out in the mid 90s, um, and it's still kind of it seems like it's only now, really, that it's that she's being cited, you know, the, in the in the way that she should be. Um, but she's done some really great work on portraiture and thinking about um, portrait miniatures and their relationship to the sonnet form, for example. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I mean, Kim Hall's Things of Darkness. I mean, it's, it's it, you're right. It's just becoming a classic book. I think it has led to a, a new younger generation, particularly of, of Black American scholars who are doing this work. I think in the UK it's still that's still developing this, and it's why it's interesting because because it's a reflection I think of what the culture's about. So it's no surprise that there's been much more work done I think recently on Anglo-Islamic work, and young British Muslim scholars are starting to do that work. Um, and in the States, of course, the debates and the issues are slightly different, you know, and questions about slavery have been much more to the fore I think more recently. I think in the UK the humanities and history study of that period particularly is still playing catch-up, but that's for very specific reasons about politically what's happened really in the last 50, 60 years in the UK in contrast to the US. Fantastic. Um, any other, any questions in the room? Oh yes, we have one at the front. Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, it's a more basic question, but I, going back to the image of our Sophia, I wondered if we could interrogate the image a little bit more. What are we actually looking at, and does it bear any relationship to anything that existed in Istanbul in the contemporary period? Is it a fantasy image, sort of a hybrid indoor-outdoor image? To some extent, yeah, and uh, you know, the portals with the figures is to some extent. However, the basic outline and the dome shape of I Sophia is, as it, and the gardens are actually re relatively accurate. So the way in which the figures are being portrayed is clearly, Morgan is interested in something else than about imperial hierarchy within the Ottoman court about religious questions. So that's a kind of overlay over, yeah, what is a pretty, you know, there's a, a Melchior Lorix uh, panorama of Istanbul from the 1550s, uh, a more <coughs> elite image by a European, you know, Western European traveler around the 1550s. So you can map it and relate it 
I mean, he's not a trained draftsman, Morgan's not a trained draftsman, but there is clearly two things going on. There's a basic understanding of the building and a representation of the building and the way in which it's changed after the 1450s when it's turned into a mosque after the city falls to, uh, to the Turks. So there is that sense of a sort of realism. There is a representation which it's recognizably Hagia Sophia, but then the figures and clearly what's going on with the representation of hierarchy, that's clearly something else that he's interested in as well. But there were, were there balconies outside the building, no, or was like that's that. an interior no. feature that yeah, it's just yeah. sort of we think so, yeah. something? Yeah. Is I, the, oh. the Byzantine walls, is that what the crenellation bit around the outside is? They would be Byzantine, yeah, it would still be Byzantine, yeah. yeah. Have you looked at, um, sorry, I'm kind of cheating and asking a question, but um, just kind of albums and kind of travel, album and macorum and, and kind of travel books. I mean, is there some kind of resemblance between the, the kind of studios that produce drawings for that, or does this seem quite unique? It seems quite unique. It, it really sticks out as an image. You know, Fuchsia Hart threw it up and we all kind of went, what on earth is that? You know, with a day and an Englishman <coughs> doing that in 1588, just has come out of nowhere. Yeah. Great, and at the back there, thank you. Uh, Hi, um, so this question is just um, inspired by um, Matthew, you were mentioning, I think it was in the 1550s of the Elephant Skull, that was um, yeah. an object of great curiosity to the public. And um, I was wondering, you know, how much, what kind of claim you might be willing to stake about that object, um, because it occurred to me that it's maybe on that borderline between natural objects and artworks, right, yeah. in the sense of being a kind of maybe proto-example of a Wunderkammer. Yeah. Mm. So I'm wondering, like, what sort of, if you could just talk a little bit about that possibility. I think it's certainly, mm -hmm. I've certainly been thinking about it in that context. Um, and it's only mentioned in the briefest of uh, sentences in uh, Richard Eden's Decades of the New World, which ends with these brief... Um, narratives by Eden relating to the first English voyages to West Africa. And um, Eden mentions the skull in order to castigate those people who file past it and just gape at it in wonder. And he uses the term wonder. And it is, it's, it's seen as an item that is wonderful, but it's wonderful because of, um, because of the way it tells us something about God's creation and God's ingenuity. And Eden's point is that people should be thinking about God when they see this object, not about kind of far-flung places or... <laughs> Um, just being amazed. They should be reflecting on the creation and their part in it. So I think it, it I think it's part of that, that kind of Wunderkammer style um, of item, but it, for Eden, it's a kind of prodigy. It's a kind of item that makes us think about God, um, but Eden says that a lot. So. Which is what a lot of art is meant to do in this yes. period. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Rachel, another question online? Yes, we have got a question um, asking if there are any more examples of uh, depictions of Muslims at prayer that could be shared or re referenced. Yeah. Well, the Hardwick Hall uh, embroidery, it's an embroidery not in tapestry, it also shows uh, an image of a mosque and it seems to show a sort of form of religious observance, but we know it's a bit of a fantasy, probably, but we date that to the 1580s. Um, there are the more, I mean, you've looked more at this in terms of the depiction of the prophet. I mean, there are more apocryphal images, um, but they're a bit earlier of the Muhammad's dove. And they tend to be a preaching rather than yeah. prayer. Mm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are accounts, but I can't think of any other images. There are moments on stage where, where the, the, pros, the, the posture of prayer is taken up. But as I say, I can't think of any images from this period. And you know we do know that from the uh, from the account uh, books uh, that we have from Henslow and so on, we have descriptions of turbans and dress, which is connected to that form of observance. So that's kind of interesting because what can we do with that in terms of recreation of those moments of performance? As Matt said, you know, post Tamburlaine, you know, Marla's Tamburlaine just kind of kickstarts an avalanche 
of representation of figures who were synonymous with you know, Islam and Muslims. This work wasn't done because, you know, people used to say to me when I started it, oh, we know the word Islam and Muslim doesn't enter the English language until the 16 teens and 20s. Yeah, true. So what are all the synonyms about Turks, you know, uh, Saracen, Mahometan. you know, Persian, Mahometan, yeah. you know, Mast, and all this kind of work about those terms. It, it's a misrecognition of what's being seen, but it doesn't mean that there's not an account of what's going on. And what's going on around the staging is fascinating because it's just a fashion. You know, the 1590s, it's like everybody writes a Turk play. You know, Shakespeare is unusual because he says, oh, everybody else has done that. I'm going to do me a more play. That's what he does with Titus Andronicus. So the representation there of religious observance, I think, is really interesting with those plays like Green Salamis, which, which are representing those forms of, of worship. Interesting. I, I think there's, there is more to be said there, too, about... Um, performance and visual representation that kind of comes out of that. So even just, um, you know, women in masks kind of being portrayed in, in these, um, in paintings where they're wearing their mask costume. So again, it's that question of what are they trying to say when they're wearing this mask costume? Are they alluding to kind of the, the ideas of the mask, which, which um, are often, you know, there's, there are Persian masks, there are masks that, um, really to kind of Ireland and to um, people that the English called gypsies. So what are those power dynamics that are at play in these seemingly kind of fanciful portraits as well? And I think you make the point that it, although, <laughs> that although we tend to see somebody in, you know, quasi-Persian dress and think that must be a mask costume, actually there may, there may have been occasions where people were just wearing that. Yes. Well, it only comes back to the Henry, the Henry point, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Apart from the case of Elizabeth, where we've got documents that suggest they were sent, but there are there are documents that suggest people are wearing these items in court or, or mixing costumes together and, and doing the Shirley's. I mean, the Shirley's yeah, are a great example <laughs> um, of just you know coming back from being ambassadors in Persia and just kind of running around insisting on keeping the the turban on and things. And, and it, it, isn't it that? then they're kind of told off and told that they need to yes, get back. Yes, they shouldn't be wearing it in the royal yeah. presence. Yes, yeah. and then there's Catholic imagery in that too. Yes, yeah, so he has a turban yeah. with a little cross on it, yeah. doesn't he? Yeah. Yeah. But um, there's that episode that Jerry mentioned before, the, the one conversion of, of a Turk to Anglicanism that happens in 1586. And that happens because Drake rescues 100 Turks from, from the new one from Colombia, brings them back to England, and they're all put up at the government's expense um, in... Uh, somewhere next to the river, just outside of the city, and then one person agrees to convert and comes in and they celebrate him. The rest are allowed to go back to Turkey on the, on the company ships. So all of those people must have been worshipping, uh, living in, in full public view. Um, there's just no accounts that remain to tell us about them. And they come back via Cartagena, and they go back via Roanoke, and they pick up um, Mante and, 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 and Vancesi. I mean, it's extraordinary. So you've got a boat full of reformed Protestants, Turks, and indigenous uh, you know, Americans, it's just mad. It's just an extraordinary, yeah. I, talk about a global moment. I know, but also <laughs> speaking about art that we can't talk about, I mean, I think that's the voyage where, is it possibly the voyage where Thomas Harriet says he loses his, his diary and his drawings in a storm, and you just think like, ah, oh, no. <laughs> what, what would those have contained, um, con considering how kind of sympathetic and interested yeah. he is in, in kind of native cultures? Absolutely. Um, I think time for one more question. Um, does anyone, oh, there's one that's a very keen question at the back of the room there. Uh, I, I've actually got three. Um, is there <laughs> okay, three. Uh, one, Quick one questions. Each. Is there any evidence of uh, where the parrot was carved? How secure is the knowledge of the distance to China? Do they know, actually know it's shorter? And would the artist know that um, that used to be a Christian church? Answer, yes, I, I imagine that they would, he would have known that. They would have known the Byzantine tradition, yeah. It's Greek Orthodox. So, one done. I'd say we can talk about yeah. that. So, the, the idea of distances is, um, it, it's still a kind of imprecise art in terms of Tudor mapping. Jerry knows more about this than I do. But 1592, uh, Emery Molyneux produces the first English globe, which I think is the basis for some of these more outlandish ideas because they look at the globe, they think, well, here's the North Sea area, we can go over here, and here is Cathaya and China. Uh, which is misleading, of course, because all of that polar region at this point in the Little Ice Age is, is yeah. covered in thick ice, so there's no way they were ever going to get through it. 
So the idea that they can shorten the passage by going north was impossible, either northeast or northwest. There were English travellers who had made it, um, Anthony Jenkinson's the most famous one, had made it through Persia and, and into, well, Koryak too, but into India. So they had some sense of the distances involved. Um, and, and later on, when English ships start to travel to Japan and China in the 17th century, um, they obviously have a much cl clearer idea of what's possible and what's not. But at this point, I think in the 1580s, 1590s, it's still a little hazy. That would be my um, in terms of the, the parrot, uh, no idea is the, the answer. Um, the, I, it could have been, so it could have kind of gone to Europe first. Um, there's a couple other pieces, such as a, a watch um, that looks, that, that's very intricately carved and that may have been carved in um, possibly kind of Switzerland or Germany before coming. And emeralds were also very fashionable in kind of Asia as well. Um, mm. And often the, the English kind of specify that they want an emerald from Asia, even though that emerald would have come from South America first. So yeah, kind of tracing it um, is, is fairly impossible. But there were um, a growing number of artisans in late Elizabethan England who, who kind of would have known how to carve emeralds as well. So whether or not they were European migrants themselves, um, Fantastic. Okay, well, con discussion can continue for those of us in the room over drinks next door shortly, but I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists once again um, for a stimulating discussion. Thank you.